Hello, everybody. My name is Michael Gary. I'm the head of content for Atmosphere. I'd like to welcome you to this session called Spotlight on Emerging CO2 Refrigeration Technologies. We have two outstanding speakers from Emerson today, Andre Patinaud and Emily Villardi, who will educate you all on, on what's happening in the CO2 refrigeration space. Uh, first, I'll say a few words about the speakers before handing it over. Uh, first, Andre is Director of Solution Strategy Cold Chain for Emerson Commercial and Res Residential Solutions. Uh, he's, I should say, well known in the industry uh, as, a, as an educator uh, of C about CO2 refrigeration. I've learned a lot from Andre over the years uh, at various uh, conferences and trade shows, and he's he's really been a uh, someone who's who spearheaded the uh, transition to CO2. Um, and his position at Emerson, he's responsible for supporting sustainable system related innovations and leveraging Emerson's global cold chain to drive adoption of integrated solutions in North America. Most recently led a marketing efforts pertaining to Emerson's food retail and chiller markets. Before that, he had managed Emerson's global CO2 development. Andre has more than 37 years of industry experience in sales marketing training and business development of HVACR system architectures and applications. So welcome Andre, a little bit about Emily Villardi. She's product marketing manager, cold chain for Emerson commercial and residential solutions. Um, she leads the commercialization of product program launches. Her responsibilities encompass creating go-to-market strategy and marketing plans, which include the target audience, positioning, messaging, and differentiation. She works closely with Marcom to develop collateral and sales enablement tools. Emily started at Emerson in 2019 as part of the Engineers in Leadership program. She spent her first year at Insincorator as the commercial product technology specialist. In her second rotation, she was strategic planner at Professional Tools. Emily earned a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. With that, I'll turn it over to Andre. Great. Thank you very much, Michael. I appreciate it. Uh, here's the Emerson disclaimer you just saw up there, but uh, Emily and I are, are excited to present to the group today about uh, the uh, Emerson product portfolio and what's really been uh, innovations coming up uh, on the Emerson side. So what we're going to cover today, we're going to break it down into a, a few sections. I'm going to start off talking about regulations real quick, regulations and industry trends. And then I'll talk a little bit about lab investments, Emerson lab investments specifically related to CO2. Um, after that, I'll get into a little bit on compression, and then Emily will cover controls. There's, there's a lot of really cool things going on on the control side, so we're excited to, to update uh, everyone regarding controls. And after Emily completes that, I'll just finish up with one slide on other specific industry support tools that uh, Emerson's been involved in specifically, though, related to CO2. And then we'll get to the questions and answer period. So next slide. So regulation trends really, um, cold chain dynamics and end users really have gone through significant change in the last two years. And it's really driven by COVID. Um, not only did we have to deal with medical refrigeration at minus 94 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 70 Celsius, but you know, globally, people were relegated to their homes instead of their offices. So many didn't feel comfortable going out and shopping. And it really put a lot of stress on, on grocery and shopping behavior changed very quickly. Even though e-commerce in grocery had started prior to 2019, it exploded. And that really caused a lot of stress through the, or, you know, through the, the chain. And just to give you an example, Total grocery spend in the U.S. is about $885 billion in 2021. And already, e-commerce grocery 
is close to 10% or $85 billion. That's significant. An industry really has accelerated change in the last few years. They started doing store layout changes, added e-commerce platforms maybe sooner than they anticipated, started partnering with third parties that maybe never thought they would ever do that, um, and then really drove innovation. Technology innovation went through the roof, and we're, we're seeing that every day. If you follow industry news, you're seeing it. Other really important dynamics around regulatory compliance, we've been living and breathing it for many years, starting, of course, with F-gas and moving into North America and other parts of the world. Well, regulatory compliance on refrigerants, as well as energy. So refrigerants addresses scope one, which is direct emissions due to leaks. Energy addresses scope two, which is the energy used in a facility or a lease facility of, of someone. So those are two real important emission factors. And then you drill down into energy efficiencies, which a lot of end users now, because they've got sustainability goals, some have net zero goals, some have 2030 goals of reducing emissions. Now, energy efficiency is super important because that's scope two, if they can reduce their electrical usage. And then, and then they've got electrification to deal with some parts of the country is more than others, adding solar, adding wind, and having the dynamics of distributed energy to deal with, and even microgrids, depending on where you are. So those are dynamics that continue to, we, we have to deal with and, and helping our customers with their internal emission reduction goals is something that we're all starting to be part of. So that's a real dynamic that's driving change in our industry, that's for sure. So the next slide, I'm gonna talk about US impact of refrigerant regulation phase down. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time only to, to kind of reinforce the dynamics that we're in. So California went ahead on their own. I'm not going to cover everything, but already as of January 2022, if you have a new system that's more than 50 pounds, a food retailer is either going to have to go with, it's got to be below 150 GWP. So your choices really are CO2 or 150 grams of propane. Now you can argue there are some that have used ammonia and secondary refrigerants. Uh, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's R290 and, and, and CO2 for now. And then there's other goals, of course. If you have less than 50 pounds um, charge, then you have to use system refrigerants that are SNAP 20 and 21, which are really less than around 1,400 GWP. And then there's other regulations coming down the pipe. Um, so, so some activity already happening. EPA, federal regulations, and you may say, finally, there's some movement here because the AIMED Act at the end of 2020 gave the EPA a power to do two, three things mainly, to have phase down HFC, so that's one major one. The next one is to have sector-based rules. And then the third one is HFC uh, management. Now, I put down some HFC phase down. There's two, there's two dates missing there because we, all, we have 2030, uh, 2030 and 2036, I believe. So there's, there's two other uh, lines missing there. Um, 2034, excuse me, at 80% reduction and 2036 at 85 reduction. Uh, but what I wanna point out is in 2024, 20 months away, now this is, Total HFC usage in every application, not just refrigeration, let's keep that in mind. Um, that number has to drop by 40% of the 2011, 2013 baseline. So there's gonna be some cost implications on higher GWP refrigerants and pressures to keep that low. So that's happening. Um, then you've got US Climate Alliance states, the third bucket here. Because EPA, but prior to 2020, there were no federal uh, regulation. Some of these states said we have to do something for our state. So they started looking at refrigerant regulations. And most of them were looking at SNAP 20 and 21 implementation. Some have already done it. Others are in, in the parliament and, and others are thinking about it. So, so there's a dynamic there that's fractured right now um, until possibly EPA um, starts or sector-based rules. And then at the far right, another dynamic is, you know, 
approving higher charges for propane, isobutane, your A3s, your flammables, but also your A2Ls, your mildly flammable, and that falls under air conditioning um, UL 2-40 and refrigeration 2-49. That's a product safety standard that both of those are completed. Now we're waiting on ASHRAE 15 application standards. And even when those are completed, we have to wait on model codes to be implemented. And generally that takes three years to happen. So a lot of dynamics going around HFCs and lower GWPs. So really the next slide really focuses on CO2 because many retailers have said, hey, I don't want to deal with a lot of the um, HFC reductions and options. I want to go straight to CO2 now so I don't have to worry in the future. So, so really that's what this is about. And the main presentation today is covering all of those products that is CO2, not all, but a lot of the products that the CO2 system have. And you can see from this chart that Emerson has a complete product portfolio to build that fully integrated system. So I'm gonna start speaking about the medium temp compressors in the next few slides, the low temp compressors, and then your variable speed drives that you see there. Um, you also see right next to the drive, an E3 controller that's specialized for CO2 application. And, and Valerie will talk about that. Moving around the top to the red gas cooler and off to the high pressure controller in the top left side, Valerie will talk about the integration of the high pressure controller and the visualization that's available in our controls that you can see what's going on with the high pressure valve, with the bypass valve that helps understand system conditions and troubleshooting. Emily will also go down to the left side and talk about some of the value added features of our new 5.4 version of the XM678 and 679 case controls, as well as the next generation of case controls, CC200, that's expandable. And she'll talk about the expandability and some of the value added algorithms that have been built into this case control that we're very excited about. And then she'll also touch on gas detectors, uh, specifically for CO2. So that's how I'm framing up what we're gonna cover today. So the next slide, please. We'll talk about Emerson's lab investments. And really Emerson's spending a, a lot of time and energy on labs for good reason, because of the, the transition to CO2 and preparing the industry for this change. A lot of trials have been going on, and yes, some end users have moved on to CO2, but there's a lot of runway left. And in order to support our customers, we're building these investments in CO2 labs. As a matter of fact, in the middle of, of our Sydney facility, we've got 100,000 square feet of R&D lab facility, and we've carved out some space for a number of CO2 components. We already have a CO2 transcritical booster system, the top left corner in Dayton, Ohio at our Helix Innovation Center. That's been there for, for uh, six years already. In the summer, we're, get, we're starting to install now in Sydney, Ohio, a, a full supermarket store. It's going to have 18 display cases from five different manufacturers, uh, a walk-in cooler, a walk-in freezer. We're going to have uh, a dry gas cooler on the roof an adiabatic gas cooler on the roof. We're gonna have a water-cooled gas cooler so we can control any gas cooler outlet temperature that we want. We're gonna also be able to have 100% false load so we could, we could test at any point and any capacity point and hold steady loads. So we've got a lot of flexibility in the design of this particular rack. Plus we've added all of the high ambient strategies that you can think of in here so we can really help understand what's going on in these different applications. Now, further to that, there's a compressor that was launched in Europe uh, last September, a transcritical scroll. So we're getting ahead and we're building a CO2 transcritical booster pack that we'll be testing in, in Ohio, one of our facilities. And then right next to that, you see you'll, at the bottom, you'll see CO2 condensing unit semi-hermetic, and CO2 transcritical scroll condensing. Just to be clear, 
Emerson has no plans on building condensing units for CO2 in North America. But the importance of building a lab for CO2 is critical to supporting our customers that are committed to doing that and have already started. That's why that's happening. We have a semi-hermetic condensing unit that's just about complete. It's been delayed due to shortages in parts, unfortunately. And then we've got another one, the transcritical scroll condensing unit that you see in the middle of the page. What's unique about this is designed to a 90 bar standstill pressure. So even the low side suction pressure, when, when the system cycles off, it will be able to manage 90 bar safely because it will have the pressure resiliency. And we want to understand what, what all that involves. And the next thing is we've got trainer. Um, Canada's had a CO2 transcritical booster trainer for several years. Um, the U.S. team has had one now. It's in Sydney, Ohio, and that will be traveling around the country, around the U.S., uh, to train all of our customers, contractors, end users, OEMs, consulting engineers, anybody that wants to come will be welcomed, of course. So, you know, at the end of the day, these investments are really about advancing our technology and, and working on solving those critical problems that, that CO2 have brought or bring in the industry. So we're pretty excited about that. So I'm gonna jump right in now to uh, talk a little bit about the compression side of business. Just a couple of slides just to, to talk about transcritical CO2 compressors that, that Emerson offers, the Copeland brand of transcritical compressors. We call them the four MTL compressors. We'll be talking about the top ones and the bottom ones here. So this particular transcritical compressor, we've got a nine different displacements and they range from 40,000 BTUs at 60 Hertz up to uh, around 300,000 BTUs at 60 Hertz. So the dot on the, in the diagram uh, represents a 60 Hertz capacity. The left side of the line represents minimum speed and of course, the right side of the line represents its maximum speed at 70 hertz. So you can see that um, when uh, the 4 MTLS 28ME at the top of the list will give you 350,000 BTUs at a um, plus at a 70 hertz rating to give you an idea. Now, bottom right corner, you see a drive there. So Emerson and Copeland has actually launched a drive um, this year that has a lot of unique features. There's, there's a micro drive called the EVM, and then there's the EVH. The micro drive is good up to 25 horsepower. The EVH is good up to 250 horsepower. So we've got combination, of course, there's price points differences. But one cool feature of those both those drives is that it has a 200% maximum overload protection for two seconds. So you don't have to overside the drive in case you're gonna get that maximum overload because you've got that protection built into the drive for a duration of two seconds. And you can hit that 200% up to 20 times a minute without damaging the drive. So it's kind of a cool feature. Now, the next compressor is a subcritical scroll. So Copeland's subcritical scroll compressor at the bottom is called a ZO. It, Z, excuse me, ZO for fixed capacity, ZOD for digital. What digital really means is it, it has the ability to unload down to 10%. That's why if you look at the bottom of the page here, ZOD 34, the line goes to the left at 60 Hertz. It'll give you around 34,000 BTUs and it can unload to about 3000 BTUs to give you an idea. So that's the subcritical. It says a small footprint, lightweight, and your modulation is done by digital instead of a drive. So that 25 to 70 hertz, don't be confused by the fact that it's at the bottom of the page. That should be up higher to relate to the 4MSL. So the 4MSL compressors are semi-hermetic subcritical compressors that are rated to very high standstill pressures uh, and 135 bar discharge pressure relief. Um, and only the four MSL um, are rated from 25 to 70 Hertz, just for clarification with this. And the capacities at the bottom are shown at a minus 25 plus 20 condensing. 
So that's pretty much it for the products that I'll be talking about. I'd like to pass it over to uh, Emily to talk about our uh, CO2 with C uh, E2 with CO2 applications. Thanks, Andre. So as you mentioned, I'll walk us through the remainder of the diagram, hitting on the controls that are critical for CO2 systems. The first one I'm going to touch upon are supervisory controls, which are really important to see what's going on within your system. How is it performing? Are there any issues with it? And as Andre mentioned, Emerson is launching the new E3 controller for CO2 applications. So I'll do a deeper dive into that. These next two slides, I just wanted to start with an overview of the E3 hardware and software prior to getting into the CO2 application that we're developing for it. So the E3 was launched just about a year ago and it's the next generation for our supervisory controls with a more user-friendly and web accessible interface to control both building and refrigeration systems. So a big benefit of this is the ease of installation when upgrading from our legacy E2 controller. So it has identical wiring holes, mounting points, and vents. And you can see on the left-hand side, the dimensions of the hardware, which are the same as the E2. So this is really important because a lot of our E2s are installed within panels. So having the same dimension allows it to easily fit into the pre-existing cutouts. Similarly, there's equivalent COM port configuration and power connection. So there's no rewiring needed for this. And really all of these components together make it really easy to swap out the E2 for the E3, taking less than 10 minutes or so to do that. With the COM ports, there is an additional um, one for added capacity. And I wanted to call out that the E3 does have 12 times more processing speed and 16 times more memory. With the uh, user interface and the display, we have updated that to a 10 inch display that is color and touchscreen. It's more user friendly and whether you're on the actual physical hardware itself, your mobile computer or laptop, the display look and feel and navigation all stays the same throughout. Uh, the last point I wanna hit on here with the hardware is it is fully backwards compatible with both our multi-flex and IONET boards. Again, very critical for a very seamless retrofit uh, installation. The associated software for this works both with the E3 as well as our site supervisor controller. And when the team was developing this, they really wanted to make sure that it was easy to use and navigate so it wouldn't require any additional training. And they did that through having icon-based navigation. So you can see that in the top picture on the right-hand side here, as well as a common toolbar. For increased visibility here, I really wanna hit on the floor plans because this is something that we've heard a lot of great feedback on. The ability for someone like a store manager or a technician or contractor to have that big picture view and that visual representation of their store, they can very easily see um, their assets and how they're performing and if anything is out of range. With that, we have priority action. So if there are alerts for items that are out of range, it is color coded based on the severity. So red is for items that are most severe. So you can quickly know um, where that lies on that scale. And it helps for a fast response time. So you can quickly diagnose the issues and you have even more detailed information through drill down screens. It is optimized for mobile. So the display will adjust to any size screen um, that you have as well as keeping, again, the same display and navigation throughout for consistency. The last point I wanna hit on here is security, which I know is something that's um, increasingly more important for everyone. And I wanted to say that we do have a regular quarterly upgrade to mitigate any risks that are here. Okay, now based on the market need, we developed a CO2 application 
that goes within the E3 controller, really to simplify the startup and management of, of CO2 systems. We did this by building upon our legacy E2E &E controller, which does today work for CO2, but we have optimized it by having this dedicated application solely for CO2. We have an enhanced user interface that's easier to navigate between applications. It's integrated with our high pressure controller as well as our case controllers. And we have added analytics at that case level. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to go a little bit deeper into each of these items. So starting with the dedicated application for CO2, this really reduces the programming efforts the customer has to do as well as reducing the complexity. Here are a handful of items that we have pre-programmed for you, starting off with the CO2 suction group. So this controls transcritical booster systems as well as parallel compression. And it's based on the previous enhanced suction group from the E2. So if you're familiar with that, it should be familiar here. And it's based again on the proven control algorithm that we have. For, um, sorry, for advanced compressor super that manages liquid and or hot gas injection, which both enables and protects the compression to reduce maintenance costs. The load management provides more precise control and recovery, especially in any extreme ambient conditions. The enhanced CO2 system monitoring. So this has additional alarms when temperatures or pressures are out of range and also works with the load management to provide better recovery, and overall, this helps to increase the safety of the system. The oil management helps with compressor longevity, and again, with that, helps to reduce associated maintenance costs. Now looking at the user interface, just from a quick glance, you can see that it's a lot more aesthetically appealing, has a more modern feel to it, and it's much easier to navigate between the applications, as I mentioned before. Um, but one of the key uh, features I want to hit on here is the fact that you're able to see the entire CO2 system in just one view. So you have your suction groups, your gas cooler, circuits, high pressure controller, as well as your case controller. However, if there are other items that are important to you, you are able to customize this display with different tables, graphs, and tiles. So really based on the user and persona, you can have what's most important to you um, in this one display. And to get even into even more detail on the high pressure controller and case controller, we have increased visibility into these, as you can see the screenshots below. And this is a really unique feature for this product, having all of this level of detail to know exactly what's going on within the high pressure controller, um, as well as the case controller. And contractors have given really good feedback on how fast that they are able to troubleshoot when issues arise because they have this level uh, of detail and can access that. In addition, at the case level, we have added analytics to, so you can see how the case performance is, as well as demand defrost. Now diving a little bit deeper into the case controllers, and these are important for CO2 systems because all have electronic valves and you need the case controller to control those. So we have two that are compatible with CO2 that I'm going to go through today, starting with the XM controller. So here's a quick overview of the hardware. It is a microprocessor based controller that manages the main loads for both low and medium temperature applications. The 678 controls a stepper valve. The 679 works with a pulse valve. And then we do have the remote case display with a keyboard navigation on it. So with this upcoming release of version 5.4, I wanted to go through a uh, few features and benefits of it. The first of which is the reduced complexity. And this is due to the fact that we now have one integration for all models and future versions. So whereas before you would have had to map out each individual model and 
each version that can now be deployed through one description file and map it for everything. Moving on to the firmware upgrades. So we do support these right in the field, which promotes serviceability. For uh, defrost, besides the standard ones of interval and time, we now have on-demand defrost through a self-learning algorithm where it only defrosts when it needs to. In addition to this, we have minimum defrost time and pump down before defrost to really optimize that. As you saw the uh, case display on the last slide, it's very intuitive and allows for easy control setting. And then lastly, this does integrate with our supervisory controllers, which you saw on some previous slides as well. Now we have, um, we are developing a new case controller. It's the CC200 and it will be launching soon. Again, it is a microprocessor based controller that controls the superheat and temperature for refrigerated fixtures and walk-ins. The main controller that you see here has patent pending control algorithm to manage loads and also has a snap-on expansion module for up to three evaporator coils. In addition, it has color-coded inputs and outputs, and this helps for ease of wiring at the install. And it's also optimized with bipolar and unipolar stepper valves or pulse valves. You can see below the controller, it has an associated mobile app as well as a touch screen case display. And I'll get into a little bit more detail on those on this next slide. So when the team was developing this, they really were focused on mitigating customer pain points. And with the expansion modules you saw, it really creates this plug and play design where based on the customer needs, it allows for a seamless integration with whatever their refrigeration setup is today. The Bluetooth connectivity to our mobile app allows you to get all of the information from the controller right on your phone, have great testimonials for this, saying that it saved a lot of time having all of that information available right at their fingertips so they can quickly diagnose any issues that come up right there at the case. For this demand defrost, we have done some store pilots and they've been very successful. So we've seen up to almost 50% reduction in the number of defrosts, as well as anywhere between 30 to 70% energy savings which then helps with uh, cost savings for the store as well. With the uh, touch screen case display you saw on the last slide, it also can be customized and it has information such as the um, status and parameters, et cetera. And finally, the communication protocol. So this does communicate with our supervisory controllers and it allows for remote access set point configuration and alarming. With that, I'm gonna review our last hardware component, the gas detectors before um, giving a brief overview of our software. So gas detectors are important for CO2 systems from both a safety and financial aspect. So for safety, these are required by code because um, as you have increasing levels of CO2, it becomes hazardous for human health. And from a financial standpoint, even just a small uh, leak rate can very quickly add up in costs of the refrigerant. So going through what we offer, we have three today that are compatible with CO2. On the left-hand side is for centralized systems. For the right-hand side are for distributed systems. So starting with the RLDS, this continuously monitors up to 16 separate zones with a detection range up to 10,000 ppm with an audible alarm when anything is out of range. Looking at the point sensors on the right, both of these integrate with our building management system and the 450 is a modular leak detecting, detector system that has a lower detection range of up to 1000 ppm and has features that promote quick troubleshooting and installation with our mobile app and our pre-calibrated sensors. The 550 is our industrial grade gas detector. So this has a larger ppm range and also it connects to local devices 
for alarming. So that wraps up our hardware as we went through the booster system diagram. Just to tie it all up, I wanted to briefly hit on our enterprise management software Connect Plus that we have. So Connect Plus um, connects devices and controllers to the cloud for a comprehensive data management to really optimize your stores. You can see from the bullets, we have a, a host of features. I'm going to call out um, two that are um, screenshotted here. The first of which is a color-coded network map. So this allows you to very easily and quickly see the health of your entire fleet in just this one map view. And then the second is the floor plans. Again, something um, very important, more detailed view of your store layout with the ability to see your assets and the temperatures of those with the ability to click into them and get more detailed information on them. In addition to these, there's additional graphs, reports, and workflows that you can get within Connect Plus. Looking at the right-hand side, these are some value adds that we offer. And I'm going to go through these, um, first of which is we can dispatch service providers to your store for any repairs that are needed. We analyze and track set point changes to make sure that you're adhering to the standards. We have data services through different APIs. And then lastly, we have pred predictive maintenance. So you can troubleshoot your assets before it goes into a failure mode. And with that, I'm going to hand it back off to Andre so he can talk about some in industry support tools so you can learn more about CO2. Appreciate that, Emily. Thank you very much. Um, so. So really, this is the last slide we want to talk about. One, one thing that's really near and dear to my heart, because I've been doing this for, and Michael said, 37 years. And pretty much when I started in the industry, you know, stewardship was, was just part of how you did business. And, and that's just held through throughout. And, and, and when we're talking about CO2, we need more of that because, you know, it's important to provide the knowledge to help prepare the industry through this CO2 transition. So, you know, it's not just about these types of seminars, it's, it's what other things can we do to help support industry? And, and, and the one on the left is something that we've been working on for over a year now. And we've, we've worked with a consulting engineering firm to basically design six different systems, all with the same capacity. So you're looking at a 25,000 square foot store, 450,000 BTU medium temp, 90,000 BTU low temp, consulting engineering firm developed all the refrigeration schedules, all the electrical schedules, all the floor plans, all the electrical plans. Then we did some, we work with it, manufacturers to come up with what are the cap X for that type of equipment. And then we work with contracting firms. What are the, the installation costs for that? And then ran through system modeling to understand what is that 20 year life cycle cost for that, for those, that equipment along of course, with, you know, direct and indirect emissions, the LCCP that I talked about the life cycle climate performance and compare that against each architecture. So it's a great information that, that you know, we're eager to share because you know, COVID hit and we weren't getting out and talking to too many people. But you know, it's information that, that end users would be interested in, consulting engineers, OEMs, uh, contractors, anybody. So, so we have that information, we're eager to start sharing it. So that's number one. Um, number two, the one in the middle here, climate study. We felt that there was actually a, a gap missing in, in knowledge uh, around how do you manage different climate zones and what is the optimized architecture required based on various um, things to look at. So we contracted this uh, consulting engineering firm that's been doing CO2 for many, many years. And we, we talked about what do we need to do to understand for example, uh, we took North America and South America, we took 166 cities, the temperature profile, the humidity, the elevation, all of that that plays into it. We looked at the asteroid climate zones, we looked at the IECC climate zones, we combined them both together 
to have a kind of a climate destination, if you will, and came up with 13 unique zones. And we looked at those cities for, if you had a dry gas cooler in CO2, how many hours of operation would you be running at transcritical zone? If you had an adiabatic gas cooler, well, how many hours of operation would you run? Run some energy at that. Look at the energy using parallel compression, mechanical subcooling, ejectors, and start comparing one to the other. And use these energy modeling tools to really look at the difference. And that's one layer based on ambient. The other layer, of course, that you have to think about are energy costs. What would switch one architecture or one high ambient strategy from here to here? Because the energy costs in that specific city are structured differently in that part of the country than somewhere else. What about water car charges and water uses and availability of water? Those are all variables that play into what is the right strategy for that specific location based on those individual dynamics. So that's what we're looking at. And that study is just about complete. And uh, so we're eager to, uh, you know, to, to, to promote that to the industry and talk about that. And the last thing on the right is uh, stewardship, um, CO2 specific stewardship. We've just last week launched a CO2 ebook. Um, we've done about 20 videos uh, CO2 videos between myself and Derek Leningkamp. So you've probably seen them on LinkedIn or Facebook. Um, they're one to two minute videos and the little Snapchats, if you will, on, uh, on a specific topic related to CO2. And what we're doing is we're taking that, those topics and scripting them out into an article series. So if you're interested in the video and you want a little bit more description, we're doing that. Plus, we've got about three uh, CO2 white papers on the go that we'll be, uh, we'll be releasing shortly, all around trying to, to increase knowledge around CO2 to you know, facilitate the transition of CO2 systems in the industry. So that is pretty much it for the uh, presentation today. So uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Andre. And thank you, Emily, for that for those great presentations. Um, you'll see here on this slide, Andre's email and Emily's email addresses. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, they've asked that you send your questions to them through their email address. So just uh, uh, to let you know, uh, we're gonna spend the next 15 minutes or so having a conversation between myself and Emily and Andre, but uh, they've asked that uh, the people in the audience send their questions by email. So just to cover that. And um, so let's go, go to some questions. Um, and I guess either one of you can answer, is the E3 CO2 BMS controller available for sale today? Yeah, so I'll take that one. Um, that's a great question. We are developing this and testing it. So we're planning to fully launch it around Q4 of this year. So we've done a lot of internal testing at our Helix Innovation Center and are now testing it at a variety of pilot sites. So I got the pleasure of going to our first one at the beginning of this month and the startup went very smoothly. The contractors were very pleased with the ease and visibility that the controller offered for that CO2 system. So continuing to test that out and will be available later this year. Okay, great. We'll be looking forward to that. Another question, um, why is it so important to be able to visualize pressure and percentage opening of the high pressure and bypass valves with the HMI? Yeah, I'll take that, uh, Emily. Well, one of the things of the CO2 system, of course, um, the high pressure controller, which is managing the high pressure valve and the bypass valve together, as well as some of the gas cooler functions, um, it's important if you've got 
a problem with the system, you'd like to be able to visualize what's going on with that valve. Is it, is it at the right percentage opening or is something wonky going on? Because if you don't have visualization to what's going on with the valve that's controlling 100% of the mass flow going to your flash tank, then you may have difficulty in trying to troubleshoot. So it's important to, to be able to visualize that. And Emily showed that in one of the slides where there was a graph. And what's kind of cool with, with the E3 is you can, you can overlay flash tank pressures, gas cooler pressures, high pressure valve opening, bypass valve opening, and layer them all on one top of each other with the same time stamp and start to visualize what's going on with the system. And is something throwing the system off. Okay, thank you, Andre. I understand the CC200 uh, case controller is currently has BACnet communication. When are you planning on releasing it with Modbus? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, so yeah, we definitely want to make sure we're addressing all of the customer needs with the different communication protocols. So Modbus is on our development roadmap and we are currently working on it and testing it today. So we plan for it to be released later this year. Okay, thank you, Emily. So looking at the marketplace uh, in North America, do you see a, a need for distributed or decentralized CO2 systems um, you know, versus the traditional rack systems? Sure, um, I'll, I'll take that one. Yeah, I, I, I believe, Michael, that there really is a place for distributed uh, CO2 systems. Um, what we've seen for the most part in North America to date have been large centralized systems. And um, with the advent of smaller and smaller compressors for CO2, there's a lot more uh, activity happening around developing systems that are smaller. And the reason that uh, that's important to retailers is, you know, if someone's looking at a remodel strategy, having a distributed, see a smaller distributed CO2 system, you can start now thinking about, okay, uh, these lineup of cases have reached their useful life. I'm gonna change all these case lineups out and I could put a CO2 system here not for the whole store, but for this area of the store, and at a later date, start transitioning more of my assets over to CO2. That's one thing from a remodel strategy perspective. And we're starting to see OEMs uh, launch these smaller types of systems around the world, and we'll see them more and more here in North America. And then the other thing is, as well as having distributed architecture for CO2, is also similar to what it would be for HFC. So when those systems are available, you have three or four of those systems throughout your store. Now you can start optimizing medium temp suctions to even improve energy further. So yeah, I, I think there's definitely a need and, and a want for those types of systems. Do you, do you see Andre um, CO2 condensing units in particular uh, as a mm -hmm. distributed system coming to the U.S. because those certainly have been, uh, they've been used in other parts of the world, but not, not in, the U in the U.S. Right. No, that, that's a great question, Michael, because we are seeing, and I know your, your website uh, highlights a lot of condensing units, refrigeration condensing unit once they're launched. And um, North America... Haven't quite seen them yet. However, there is activity and we've got end users that are starting to ask for these types of units. I mentioned earlier, they've got, they've got net zero goals and they, may, they don't care that some of these end users don't care they're early adopters. They wanna learn, they want the technology. Um, about a year ago now, NASRC did an end user uh, survey specifically about condensing units. CO2 condensing units. And the end user's response, Michael, were, I think I had that written somewhere, 39% of them would like them when they go to add additional loads to a new system, 39% of them said that would be a good application for that. That's one thing. 
Another 39% said that when they're doing a remodel strategy, just what I talked about for a distributed you know, pack, from a condensing unit perspective, remodel strategy works well for many of those. So um, the need is there. We're a little further behind because of there's a lot of extra uh, approvals that need to be done and North Americanize the unit. So that takes a little bit longer. You're taking some of the European, um, initial European designs and North Americanizing it. So there's a bit of a, a lag time uh, between that, but the, 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 the need and the requests are, are starting to mount for sure. What about for s small grocery stores or even convenience stores? You see the condensed CO2 condensing units for those yeah. kind of? Yeah, so that, that's a great question. So it, whether it's a distributed mini pack that the first question you ask, or even a condensing unit, I think that, again, those retail, those C stores that, that want to drop their GWPs or, or go straight natural, naturals, that, that's a good place for them. And if they've got if they've got car wash and they want warm water, you've got some good heat reclaim capabilities there. Um, so that's kind of interesting as well to, to, to leverage the heat source from the CO2 system. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah. Um, another question, uh, you were talking about your uh, CO2, your new CO2 controller uh, with native algorithms. What is the CO2 application that benefits the most from a native algorithm approach? Yeah, good question, Michael. Um, so I'd say with that, with the algorithms, what we really are trying to do is make CO2 easy for people. And we've done that by eliminating a lot of the programming that historically the customer had to do to set it up. So from the OEM perspective, it's a lot easier for them to get that all set up within their factory. And then from a contractor or technician perspective, it makes it a lot faster to start up a system, commission it, and troubleshoot it by having a lot of it pre-programmed for you. Yeah, if I can just add to that, uh, Michael, um, the current product that we have, the E2, um, contractors would need to add the program, extra programming that Emily talked about. We call them flex combiners. And depending on how many things that the, 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 the system has, how many peculiarities the system has, the contractor has got to write these, these applications or flex combiners. And that might be fine and dandy because that guy knows what he's doing, but everybody writes them differently. And that's where the challenge is. So if one writes a flex combiner, someone else comes in later to troubleshoot, he has to find time to figure out what, what was written in order to maybe modify it. The beauty of the native algorithms now is that goes away. It's a standard application and all of that confusion um, is eliminated. And to, to Emily's point, it makes it easier to troubleshoot and apply. Right, definitely uh, an advance for CO2. Uh, yeah. You guys have certainly done a, a tremendous amount of work on the research side, you know, starting with the Helix Center, which I, I visited years ago when it opened. And now with these new, uh, new facilities you're developing for research at CO2, what is do you think going to be the biggest focus of this CO2 research, do you think? Well, I, I think for us, it's, it, it's speed, Michael. Um, it's to quickly advance our technology and, and portfolio, really to accelerate industry adoption. Um, because we understand there's some pain points out there. Uh, there's some fears out there. System complexity is one. So working on reducing system complexity, and, and that's one that Emily just talked about. Um, cost. We, we've heard we've heard Checo, we've heard NESRCs and other talk about how do we how to reduce costs? How do we maybe take one strategy away and do it a little differently, but at a lower cost and have the same energy implication or energy reduction implication? So that that's super important. And the other thing is why we invested so much in the climate study as well 
is to really understand the right solution for the right ambient with the right conditions, you know, so that you're not paying too much. And that gives you, gives maybe a retailer a negative connotation when perhaps there could have been another option that was lower cost, but understanding those is, is key. Maybe not, but maybe so. So I think accelerating all of that to help the industry with the, that transition that we talked about is really what we're focusing on the most. Speaking of costs, when is your TCO's total cost of ownership study coming out or has it come out? It is completed. It is now. So, so we, are, we are ready and willing to, uh, to present, <laughs> no doubt. Okay, we'll talk more about that. Okay, cool. Um, okay, we, we focus mostly on CO2, but uh, in the remaining few minutes, uh, maybe we'll turn a little bit to R290 propane. Sure. Um, as, as, as you know, the uh, charge limits have been uh, raised mm -hmm. by uh, UL. Mm -hmm. um, and as you, as you alluded to, that still, there, there still needs to be more approvals uh, from the EPA and, and so on and, and the model codes. But um, I think manufacturers like Emerson are starting to look ahead at um, components that are designed for the higher 300 gram and 500 gram charge limits. When will sure. Emerson begin uh, making those, or providing those components? We have those today, Michael. So mm -hmm. we, we've had we've had R two ninety condensing units, uh, reciprocating compressors, scroll compressors, fixed speed, variable speed already for the one hundred fifty gram limit. But but we also have them for much higher charges. Mm -hmm. Is and that product is is available now for testing um, in a variable speed or a fixed speed, and even the components that go with it, the flow type components that go with it. And controls, um, we have that portfolio ready now. Okay, so when when the uh, final changes are approved, then people can already look look to your company for some components. Right, the component level is the higher charges, correct. which will. Uh, do you think that'll have a big effect on the um, R two ninety case case marketplace? Well, I think it's one of those things, uh, Michael, that will help reduce the cost, the relative cost of today. If you know, if you need a three circuits to do a, a twelve foot case, and maybe you can get away with with one circuit now because it's a it's an open. You can have five hundred grams. Um, so those are things that are going to help drive the cost, the applied cost down relative to what we have today with the one hundred and fifty gram limit. Okay. It can certainly help. Absolutely. All right. Well, I want to thank uh, our speakers, Andre and Emily, for their great presentations. And again, uh, any questions from the audience, uh, please direct them to the emails that you see on the screen. And uh, with that, I'll uh, say that we've concluded the session. Thanks again for attending. And thanks to again to our speakers. And the next session will be on Johnson Controls. Uh, coming up very shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Okay, Thank bye bye. You.